Today I'm interviewing Clive Lewis, he's Labour's Shadow Defence Secretary. Uh, after only being a Labour MP for just over a year, which just shows how uh, things are in flux in the Labour Party at the moment. Clive's got a very interesting history, he grew up on a council estate, uh, he's a former soldier. I'm at the Imperial War Museum, subtle, see what we've done there. I should say as a disclaimer, he's a friend of mine as well. He's a great guy, just so no one you know, suggests I'm being, uh, not being fully open. And I also should say, I did suggest that maybe he could stand as the left candidate in the Labour leadership election. Uh, people suggest I was a, uh, a right-wing sellout and traitor for doing so. Hello. He's a fascinating guy and I'm going to talk to him about the Labour Party, the Labour Party leadership, his own backstory and where next. Hi. Oh, here yeah. he is. I actually, I keep noticing the occasional grey hair because of <laughs> because of the last <laughs> few weeks. They were there they're before. No, they, no they, I think they have come out. Uh, they've come out in full bloom. Have they with you? Are uh, you dying? Last, I should last, start dying. The man. last three weeks, Silver Fox look is, is in, I'm told. So. <laughs> you could be the George Clooney of the uh, of I don't Labour know about Bank. that. Um, so, come on, right, just a quick summary of your year. <laughs> just over a year ago, you How long you got? I know, yeah. Uh, it's been quite the year. Uh, you were elected as uh, MP for North South for the first time. You're now Shadow Defence Secretary of the official opposition. Now, I'm not laughing, I mean, it's a serious thing. Is it? I mean, apart from the Got slide, it sounds, it sounds like so ridiculous. It's obviously a really serious job, but yeah, it does sound ridiculous. How, I mean, that, that is quite a jump. Yeah, that's, it's, that it's like a, a nitroglycerine turbocharged boost. Your hair, my, if I had hair, it would have just gone back. <laughs> it's just been, it's just been, it's been phenomenal. I kind of came in to um, Parliament and you know, a number of people have said to me, you know, look, there's a black mark against your name. Some of the things that you've said, some of the positions you've taken, some of the things you've done in your past in terms of politically. So I, I kind of assumed I was going to be on the back benches for yeah. quite a long while. I feel I've been thrust too quickly into the shadow cabinet. If you're down in London more than you want to be. I want to be back in my constituency. I want to be doing things in the constituency. I want to be known as constituency MP. And I'm trying to do that, but it's hard when you're doing both those things. Do I think that I can do the job uh, with the support of my colleagues, yes, I do. Um, I think, but it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult time. But I think, you know, one of the things about what's happened is that people who otherwise, talents in the party who otherwise wouldn't have been seen, have now come forward. And that's not just those around Jeremy Corbyn, there's other people who've come up because of necessity into, uh, onto the front bench that have been brilliant. You were a soldier, you became a soldier. And mm. actually, that's rare for two reasons, not just as a Labour MP. Dan Jarvis is another example, but you and Dan Jarvis aren't on the same wing of the party. You're on the left of the Labour Party. Mm. How did someone with your politics end up in the army? There's a couple of key things. First of all was my granddad on my mum's side. He was a paratrooper in Normandy in the Second World War. Wow. And I used to go back with him to Normandy. And I used to see the camaraderie. And I wanted a little bit of that. And also when I was working at the BBC, I needed an extra challenge. I didn't think I was being pushed enough. I chose not to go to Iraq. Um, because as a reservist, you, there is what's called inter, you know, intelligent mobilisation. Although you can be called up, you can sometimes have a little bit of a say. I didn't want to deploy to Iraq. But Afghanistan, I was in London for the 7-7 bombings, and I remember I was thinking, you know, my friends, my family live in London. I was also acutely aware that Afghanistan had been let down by the West after it had been used to, as, a, as a proxy to fight the, the Soviet Union. I also wanted to try and help the people of Afghanistan. Now that sounds very worthy and people say, well, you're a soldier, you're a gun, you're going there as a, as a conqueror, as, a, as an imperialist. That's not how I saw it. The interaction I had with the local people, I felt like I was doing something positive. How did it kind of shape your attitudes to war? When you've seen civilians with their legs blown off, mm -hmm. when you've seen soldiers with being you know, operated on to save their lives and they don't make it, when you've seen the actual physical effects of war, of bombs, of guns, it does make you think twice when you um, vote and debate on an issue, it, it, it is a debate and issue. And at one level, you do know the gravity, and I think most MPs understand the gravity of what they're doing. But it does make a difference when you can visualise the physical implications of what you're actually going to do. You know, I'm not a pacifist, clearly, but I do think that if you are going to make the world a better, safer place, then you need to have a complete approach, a holistic approach, a strategy, not just a military strategy, but a political strategy. You can't bomb ideas out of existence. You can't use bombs and bullets to drive people mm -hmm. to a negotiating table and make a peace. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you've got to put your hand out. It's got to involve education. It's got to involve economic opportunities, justice, fairness, social, mm -hmm. social justice and equality, all these kind of things. And I think without that, 
we're never going to be able to solve the problems. And if you look around the world at the moment, most people think it's going to hell in a handcart, and they're mm. not far wrong. When you get, came back from Afghanistan, you had depression. Mental distress generally is something that men find quite difficult to talk about. Mm. As a kind of man-up culture, stop, you know, man up, stop being, you know, pull yourself together. Man up, cupcake. Indeed, that kind of thing. And, and, you know, the biggest killer of men under 50 is, is suicide in this country. From that experience, I mean, just talk through, the depre- you know, just briefly the depression, but also that, how hard it is as a man to talk about those sorts of problems. It is hard. Um, I had a really supportive BBC management and colleagues around me when I came back. Not everyone has that. And I felt myself kind of slipping. And I think if you've not experienced depression before, you you don't quite know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Mine manifested itself in a sense of guilt. The fact that I survived, the fact that I was feeling bad when I knew I'd seen other soldiers who were on, who'd seen so much more, had so much more happen to them, Mm -hmm. you know, experienced so much more loss. And yet I thought I had no right to feel like that. I felt guilty. It's debilitating. You know, when we were on tour, one of the favourite sayings was man up cupcake. Um, So there is a sense that, you know, you're being weak. You feel feeble, you mm. feel um, yeah, emasculated. But when I did get help, I did get medical help. I did get, I get sort of got some medication and some counselling, and it helped. The coup launched against Jeremy Corbyn. Um, firstly, do you think it was pre-planned? And secondly, are you angry? There were some people in our party, on the right of the party, mm. who knew full well what they were doing. They'd planned this for a long while. I think the vast bulk of the PLP hadn't. I think many of them wanted to make a go of it to varying degrees, but I think there was a, there was a, there was a good number of, of, of MPs who wanted to make a go of this, who wanted to give it their best shot. I've got no end of respect for that. But there was a small minority, I feel, who were completely sucker punched by Jeremy's insurgency at the last leadership election and were determined to do all they could. It was just a matter of timing. There are lots of colleagues, you know, MPs who are you know, tearing themselves apart because they can see the changes to their party, they can see the the building of new members. And whilst I do accept that there have been some people who have used this as an opportunity to come in, the vast number of people who've joined our party are everyday people who've been frustrated with the way that politics has been run this last 20 or 30 years and wanted to see a difference. And that's been embodied in Jeremy Corbyn. Is he perfect? No, he isn't. But I think the way that the party, some elements of the party and the PLP have responded to this has in many ways been less than satisfactory. The accusation though could be this. Yes, obviously, lots, a big chunk of the PLP, the media are gonna come out to get you. But that the operation in dealing with that has been incompetent and shambolic and has lacked clear direction. I think over the last year, um, they've struggled. And I think the reason that you have to understand why Jeremy Corbyn, his office, his team has struggled, there are lots of reasons. You can't blame it on the media, but it's a factor. You can't blame it all on elements of the PLP, but it's a factor. And then you've also got the fact that the left has come literally from nowhere overnight into a position of leading Her Majesty's opposition. And I think mistakes have been made, and that's difficult difficult because there just isn't the experience there to be able to run an operation and hit the ground running. When we nominated Jeremy Corbyn a year ago or so, um, we were saying we want we don't want our party to shift to the right, as it was after the general election. We wanted Jeremy Corbyn in there to bring the debate back to the centre. But, you know, as we said to Corbyn, you only meant to blow the bloody doors off, mate. <laughs> but he went and won. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's had its own difficulties. But I think, you know, I look at what's happening in our party at the moment. I look at the way, I think quite disgracefully, um, some members, um, some people who are just genuinely normal people who want to be a part of a party, who want to have a vote, the way that they're being disenfranchised, mm. the way they're being put off. I think it's for a social democratic party to be acting like that. If Owen Smith wins with this having happened, I think it'll be a Pyrrhic victory. You know, we're meant to be a social democratic party. The, you know, the clue is in the democratic bit. There's no question Jamie Corbyn has hugely enthused a chunk of the population. The broader polling for Labour is mm. calamitous. Yeah. And I found the most heartbreaking bit of polling was 18 to 25 year olds, according to one poll, prefer Theresa May as Prime Minister to Jeremy Corbyn. I'm not surprised, and I tell you why I'm not surprised. It's become a self-fulfilling prophecy that Jeremy Corbyn is an unelectable leader. When your own party or elements of your own party are saying that, and then you've got also got a, a pretty much established media, including the so-called liberal wing of that media, also saying the same thing, it does become a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I think if people think changing leader is going to all of a sudden make our party uh, electable. I think they're sadly mistaken because I think what's happening at the moment in our politics goes far beyond Mm. who the leader is, what particular 
policy angle they take. We have to be quite frank here, Scotland isn't coming back to Labour anytime soon. Now people may call me a defeatist for saying that, I call that being pr pragmatic and being a realist. As it's well known on the record, I believe in PI and proportional representation, I've got my own personal preferences for that, but I think that as the tribalism of the past, as a party, is something that we are going to have to question, we are going to have to challenge, because personally, I'd rather be in government with Caroline Lucas than in opposition uh, booing her when she speaks. Mm. That isn't the future. Yes, I have issues with Liberal Democrats, there are orange bookers and so, but there are also some decent Liberal Democrats. And, dare I say it, you know, some of the nationalist parties, the SNP, Ply Cymru, many of them are socially progressive. What is it that we can find in common that can unite us to be able to take on the Tories and the rise of the new authoritarian right in this country? These are questions that we as a party have to start addressing. We do feel at the moment, in the, as the Labour Party, as a Kodak, Kodak party in an Instagram era. We're very much a 20th century party. Mm -hmm. What does social democracy look like in the 21st century? And what is our relationship like with an electorate and with other political parties that has fragmented even mm -hmm. since 1997? And I think you have to look at that if you actually want an analysis of how we move forward. Perhaps an unkind view, though I want to see what you think about this, is that basically the policies being offered now by the Labour leadership are roughly basically the same policy, policies Ed Miliband offered. Ed Miliband presented those policies as being more right-wing than they were, and Jamie Corbyn's just got many of the same policies and is presenting them as being more left-wing. What I, do you think I, about I that? Think, what are the I, new policies? I don't think you're ever going to see everything happen. You know, it's been a year. It's been quite a, it's been quite a traumatic year, <laughs> but it's been a year. There was a five-year plan to gently and gradually move and bring the public along with us and saying, look, this is what we could have. This is how we're going to change it, and this will be the outcome. But you, We've had a year, less than a year, and that year has basically been spent navel-gazing. You have to give this this process, this new type of politics, a chance to kind of work on through. The Tories are the most effective political force on earth. Given how disastrous the polling is for Labour, if they call a snap election, Labour risks being wiped out as a political force, and the left will be blamed for it and will just go down the swanee. Does that, is that not a worry? Of course it's a worry. It is, I think, for everyone. Anyone that's been involved in the Labour Party and Labour politics and politics generally can see what a precipice we're on. But you can't give up. You can't give up hope. You can't just throw in the towel and say, it's all looking really bad, let's go. Now, I've got my own particular view about what the best route is, the best path is. I don't think I know it. I don't think, I'm not arrogant enough to think it's the only, the, only, the only way forwards, but I think each of us has an idea, and it's about articulating those ideas, explaining them to the public, and trying to prove to them that actually, you know what, we could run this country far better than this current government is. These are tough times for us, Tempting. but it's, it, they, they are tough times, but they'll temper us as well. And I think what comes from this will make us stronger. So so there are opportunities here as well as pitfalls, and I think we have to remember that. It's not all doom and gloom, I mean. Finally, would you like to be leader of the Labour Party one day? Um, I think anyone that says no, I was speaking to an MP, this is a long-winded answer, I was speaking oh, to an MP you're and... you're such uh, a politician uh, no, answer, no, 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 I was speaking, to, I was speaking to another MP who had kind of, kind of thought about going for it. And they said, you know, you shouldn't be in this job unless you've got the hunger. I think if you want to make the world a better place, if you want to make your country a better place, you want to make that change, if the best place you can do that is as leader of the Labour Party, then you'd be stupid not to do it. But if your role can be on the back benches, if your role can be as a shadow cabinet member, as a front bencher, as a PPS, whatever it is, as a party activist, then you do it. So, you know, if I feel I can make a difference, I would. But I'm not, you know, I understand it's a kiss of death to say you want to be leader of the party. I'll just take I, it along with a yes, but thank you. Yeah, you son of a... <laughs> Cheers, <come on. laughs> Thank you, mate. <laughs> nah, asked him the Labour leader question there, didn't I? He didn't like that. Tough. That's what I'm here for, asking questions. Um, I thought it was a really interesting interview. I think, you know, we covered quite a lot of ground. And uh, I think, well, you know, depending on the future of Labour, he's got a very bright future indeed. And, you know, I think future leader potential, you know. So I want to hear what you think, though. So, you know, what do you think of that? Leave your comments. Uh, we've got loads of interviews to come, uh, particularly on the Labour Leadership Contest. I think this channel will be the you know, the, the must-see channel when it comes to what happens in Labour over the coming weeks. We've got loads of interviews, you know, here, click on the screen, take your pick. Um, and as ever, subscribe, spread the word. I'll see you next time.